we can divide by p prime. So we get here p lambda of z divided by p prime lambda. Here we get 1, and here we get 1 over p prime. So when z goes to 0, this one goes to infinity faster than this one. So this goes to 0, this goes to 0. So the image of 0 is just the point at infinity. 0, 1, 0. OK? Because the pole of p prime at 0 is higher than the pole of p. Now, I will briefly finish and go back to the other part. The interesting part is that uh, on this side, so on that cubic curve, on any well, cubic curve, you can define a, a geometrical addition law. So usually a cubic curve looks like this. You take two points, P and Q. You take the line through the points. It gets you to a point here. That's not the, the point you want to be the sum. That's r. You take the vertical line, and this is p plus q. And that works only for cubic curves. It's not easy to show that it's really an addition law. The difficult part is the associativity of the, of the sum. But it is. So on this side, we have also, so in the image here, we have a group law. Also here we have a group law because this is a quotient of, of C modulo lambda. C is a group. This is a subgroup. So this is also a group. And this map, let's call it capital phi, is actually a group homomorphism. And I'm kind of disappointed. I should have liked to hear, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody said it. Hmm. <laughs> Meaning, it's totally non-trivial that this is a group homomorphism. Completely. Meaning, here you have a one additional law, just the addition of complex number. You're applying this weird function, and you end up on something, and the law of, and the sum is preserved. Meaning. It's, it's really astonishing. And the reason why it's true is that uh, the various trust p function has addition formulas, which correspond exactly to the addition here. It's also not only as addition formulas, but they are compatible with the, with the group structure on the, on the image, so on the cubic curve. What is an addition formula? You all know addition formulas. Maybe you don't know what, that you know addition formulas, but what's an addition formula? It's like, uh, okay, I have no more space. I have to erase something. Oh no, I have space. Here. <laughs> so what's an addition formula? Take sign signs of x plus y. How can you write it? So again, go again. Sign x cos y. Oh, so you do answer. Cos x sine y. So what are you doing here? You have a formula for the sine of a sum in terms of the sine and the cosine of x of the terms that you are summing. And notice that the cosine and the sine are one of the, are one the derivative of the other. Similar formulas are here. So if you take, I'm not writing the formula down, but if you take p lambda of c plus w, you can write it as an expression in p of z, p of w, p prime, and p prime of w. Exactly like here. 
meaning um, one, of the one of the main contributors to the study of elliptic canton was Jacobi. He lived uh, in the first half of the 1800s. And uh, one of his major uh, paper was um, on elliptic function was called Fundamenta Nove Theoria Funciona Ellipictorum. At the time, still Latin was the free language of science. Now it's English, but at the time it was Latin. And uh, the, func the elliptic function that he introduced, he actually called them the new sine and the new cosine because they were satisfying this addition law. So these are very important, were very important from the beginning. So the fact that we have this addition law and this addition law are compatible with the formulas to give this summation here gives the fact that this is a group homomorphism, which is astonishing. I'm still pissed that you didn't go, ooh. <laughs> OK, so that was to sum it up, meaning uh, we don't really need this part. It's just telling you that uh, the, the object here and the object that you obtain here are the same which is a good information and it's a beautiful piece of mathematics, so that's why I told you. But let's go back to, the, to what we're doing. So we have to study, I will finish with the, with, the, with the motivation a bit and then I will start studying the action of the modular group, I will define the modular group. So. You can read the question there. The question is, uh, we have seen that, uh, you know, that we can associate to a lattice a complex tori. By the way, these complex tori are what are called uh, the Riemann surface. Later on, I will discuss a little bit more about what is a Riemann surface because we need it for another part. So when, did, when two of these are isomorphic, so for which, what's the relation on the lattice? So, first of all, let us introduce the definition when two lattices are homothetic. So, if you can just multiply by a non zero, oh, sorry. Of course, here alpha has to be non zero. It's non zero. So, in that case, they're called homothetic, the two lattices. And it can be proven that. Uh, if you have an alpha that, that is not a homotety, but just you have the, an inclusion, so alpha times lambda 1 is in lambda 2, then you can define a subjective math just by sending, you take a representative here, you multiply by alpha, and then you take its class in, um, in the C module lambda 2. It's a well-defined, and we don't need this one now, but with respect to the Riemann surface structure, this is an holomorphic map. And if Actually, the two lattices are homothetic. This is an isomorphism. And uh, did I skip one? No. Actually, that's the only way that it can happen. This is, a, this is a, another theorem that I'm not going to prove. Soon I will start proving stuff, so don't worry. We will have lots of computation. So two lattices are homothetic if and only if the complex torus are isomorphic. So what it's telling you is telling you that if you want to study the set of isomorphism classes of the of the tori, it's enough to study the set of homothetic lattices in the complex plane. So one geometric object it can be reduced to a much simpler object. So we put some terminology, we take uh, script lambda is the set of lattices, we have an action as I we just introduced, of C star. So here we are using again group action. So we just multiply. You can verify there is a group action. And uh, we call the orbit uh, is just a set of all the lattices that are homothetic. And uh, the quotient, so what is the quotient? The quotient is just a set of orbits. We would like to have it more structure on it, and we will put more structure on it later on. So two complex tori are isomorphic if and only if the associate lattice are homothetic. So we have a, a bijection between L modulo C star, script L modulo C star, 
and this. Now this, for what I just erasing, is also in bijection with a set, it's more complicated, of isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. So, and that's also an object that is worth studying. So, but let's skip to this one. So, since this is an interesting object, we would like to understand what this, with this quotient look like, L modulo C star. And that's what we are gonna do from now on. So first, lemma. So we have to understand how can we represent, uh, when you wanna study a quotient, what you have to find, it's a good set of representatives. So for each orbit, you have to have a way to pick up one representative in a sort of uniform way so that uh, this uniform choice gives you a, a model space for the quotient. So we start, it's gonna be a long process, it's not gonna be easy. So we start with this little lemma. And now I'm starting proving things. And uh, as a rule, the As a rule, the statement are on the slides, the proof are on the blackboard. So, so we have more shock. Okay, good. So, proof. Okay, suppose we pick a lambda, we destroy the chalk. Lambda and we suppose it's generated by omega one and omega two. And I remind you that omega one and omega two have to be linearly independent over R. So linearly independent over R. In particular, this means that the imaginary part of omega, which one I want to do? Omega two over omega one is different from zero. Okay? So now I can, uh, so it's either positive or negative. Since the imaginary part of omega 2 over omega 1, it's minus the imaginary part of omega 1 over omega 2. I can switch them, but I can assume up to switching can assume that the imaginary part of omega 2 over omega 1 is bigger than 0. Okay. And now I'm done, because now what I do, I have my lattice, lambda it's uh, omega 1 z plus omega 2 z, and then I take, uh, I take 1 over omega 1 time lambda. Okay, so that's a, a complex number. This is an homothetic, uh, an, a lattice uh, homothetic to lambda. And what's its basis? This is uh, z plus omega two over omega one times z. And omega one over omega two is imaginary part bigger than zero. And so we are done. This is of the form that we require. Now, okay, is there any way to get some water? Water, thank you. With the chalk, when you write on the, ch on the board, the chalk uh, gets you, oh. Okay, so, 
we see that every lattice is a multi-architectural lattice of that form. So if we take uh, the upper half plane, that is denoted by that uh, weird H, it's a German H, uh, we have a map from H to L uh, modulus C star that sends to every complex number with imaginary parts bigger than one, bigger than zero, to the associated um, lattice constructed in that way. This map is surjective. Wouldn't it be nice if it was also injective? It would be, but it's not true. <laughs> so we have to work some more to find our model space. OK, and uh, what do we have to do? We have to actually consider now an action on H by some um, other group. So first uh, recall that we can act on um, on, um, on C in general, if it's just a matrix, you can act by fractional linear transformation, which means that if you have your uh, A, B, C, D, then you write uh, A times Z, it's just A, Z plus B divided by C, Z plus D. That's a, I encourage you to check that this is a, an action in the sense that the bus explained to you. And then we have another lemma. Do I want to prove this one too, or this one I skip? No, this one I skip. I mean, this is really a computation. You just have to compute the imaginary part of this complex number, and it ends up to be this one. So I, I'm sure you can do it pretty easily. There is no trick there. Just compute the imaginary part. But what it tells you, it tells you that uh, if you, if for example, you take here something that has uh, this is just the determinant of the matrix. If you take something that has determinant one, then the imaginary part is just. No, what that was for drinking, not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, but it was for drinking, not for. I, I can also use that one, but. So if you take something with the determinant one, if, if, ta, if tau has imaginary part bigger than zero, also the image has imaginary part bigger than zero. So more precisely, we can take um, SL to Z, which is the um, two by two matrices with integer coefficient and determinant one. SL to Z is called the model group. Oh, thank you. No, 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 that's too much. <laughs> Thank you. So it's, uh, it's called the modular group. The modular group that we saw in the, meaning that we refer it to as the title. Okay. It acts on C by fractional linear transformation, but Actually, it acts, it acts on H, on fractional linear transformation, because from what we just saw in the previous slide, if the AD minus BC is 1, then the imaginary part of tau is bigger than 0, as long the imaginary part of the fractional linear, meaning of the transform, is bigger than 0, as long as the imaginary part of tau is bigger than 0. So we have this action. Now, what do we do with this action? First of all, we have to prove something that, uh, oh yeah, I have this piece of information. Well, minus one acts like uh, the identity. So sometimes you, when you want to use a, a smaller group that it's easier to deal with, you take uh, the quotient group. So you mod out uh, SL to Z or gamma one as you want to call it, and, and by the subgroup generated by minus one, you get something smaller and sometimes it's easier. So. This is called gamma one because you can introduce uh, several congruent subgroup of this SL to Z and you can actually do a similar theory for the congruent subgroup, which is more complicated. We are not gonna do that. Uh, and it still has a big relation with the complex story, meaning it's a parameterization of some other thing. But 
OK. So this is the lemma that it's very crucial. Because they tell you that, um, that this action is actually what we were looking for. Because it tells you that two lattices are homothetic if and only if there is this gamma in our mod in the SL2G, so in the modular group, such that gamma of tau 1 is equal to tau 2. So this tells you that uh, being homothetic is just equivalent to being in the same orbit under gamma 1. So this one we prove. It's not difficult, but at some point, I mean, this is the part that was it's the part of the course relevant to us. So we have to prove some things. Not everything, but some things. So, let's prove it. OK. So, I will need this one again for sure. So, it's an if and only if, so we have to prove two directions. We start with, with this direction. So, we are assuming that the lattice are homothetic, and we want to show that there is a gamma. So lambda 1, uh, so lambda tau 2 is equal alpha lambda tau 1. And I want to produce, I want to produce gamma, gamma 1 such that gamma tau 1. Tau 2. Of course, it's the same if I produce gamma tau 2 is equal to tau 1. I take the inverse. So, what does it mean that uh, lambda tau 2 is alpha tau 1? Well, it means that uh, we have the following fact. We have 1 must be equal to here. What is this group? Remember, this is uh, z plus tau 2 z. So, in particular, inside here, there is 1. So 1 has to be obtained as alpha of something. So it's alpha of uh, an element in here. An element in there is theta 1 plus d. And similarly, tau 2 has to be alpha of something. And that's something we call it a tau 1 plus b. OK, so now you already see a, b, c, d appearing. <coughs> And here we have A, B, C, and D are all in Z, because this is group. All, everything is generated over Z. So tau 2, I can also write it as tau 2 over 1. And so I can write it as uh, alpha A tau 1, tau 1 plus B divided by alpha c tau one, tau 1 plus d. And so I get that a plus b c. So tau 2, and this is just gamma of tau 1 is gamma. OK? So I produce a matrix with integer coefficients that, uh, as I imagine, uh, such that gamma tau 1 is tau 2. Am I done? Or I have to do something more? Tan, 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 tan. Should be in gamma. So I have to show, I still have to show that the determinant of gamma is 1. That part I haven't shown yet. I just produced gamma. OK. 
Well, this is meaning, uh, I think I'm going to leave this part as an exercise. It's simple, meaning, uh, do I want to do it? Well, I'll, I'll give you one piece. So, from here, you also have that uh, alpha minus 1 lambda tau 2 is equal alpha uh, is equal lambda tau 1, right? So you can redo the game, right? You can write, you can write uh, 1 is equal to alpha minus 1 a prime, uh, sorry, uh, c tau c prime and tau 1 is alpha minus 1 a prime tau 2 plus b prime. Then what I claim, and you can check this pretty easily, that uh, a prime, b prime, c prime, d prime, if I call this, this is just gamma inverse. You can check that is gamma inverse just by resubstituting this one in here and make the computation, you get equation, and you see that there are, there are exactly the relation to say that this is just, that this matrix is gamma inverse. So check, you can check this one. And once you have gamma inverse, which is also an integer matrix, then it means that uh, the determinant, uh, I'm here, yeah. determinant of gamma is plus or minus one. That's the only possibility. It's the only, meaning if the determinant is, if the matrix is invertible, it can only have the determinant plus or minus one. And you take out minus one because both tau one and tau two have imaginary bigger than zero. So minus one, no, because imaginary of tau one and imaginary It's no sense. I'll just say it again. So, and it must be one because both tau, tau one and tau two have imaginary part bigger than zero. If one was with minus one, would change the imaginary part. Okay. Everybody on board. Question. Question. No. Yeah. Uh, so to be honest, I actually don't understand the part where you write this alpha inverse time to write this. Why, why I write this one? Not that one. This one? Yes. It's the same thing, meaning since uh, lambda tau 2 is alpha lambda tau 1, if I multiply everything by alpha minus alpha, it's always non-zero, right? So I multiply by alpha minus 1, what do I get? I get alpha minus 1 lambda tau 2 is equal alpha minus 1 times alpha, so it's equal lambda tau 1. OK, so now I can, I can do the same thing that I did here in the, in the opposite direction. So OK, I have this relation, so I can write 1 is alpha minus 1 of something in here. So of, uh, it's alpha minus 1 of, let me see, c prime tau 2 d prime, which is an element in here, and tau 1, that is the element in there must be alpha minus 1 of something in this lattice. So I, I write it this way. And then you can check by just substituting these two equations in here. And so if you substitute this one and this one inside here, then you get that 1 is some expression in uh, c tau 2 plus d, c prime tau 2 and plus d prime and a prime tau and that gives you a relation that actually tells you that this matrix is the inverse of the other one. You can do the computation. It's a very simple computation. It has to be done. It's not uh, meaning. It's not automatic. But if you write it, if you substitute and work it out, you get that this is uh, some multiple of tau 2 plus some multiple of, um, but it cannot be any multiple of tau 2 because it's only one. So that part goes to 0 and then gives you that 0 on one section of the product matrix, which then gives you that the, the matrix is the inverse.
So you have, you have just to check it, meaning. It's like a five minutes computation. You sit and do uh, it. OK. Now, this is only the first, oops, first half. Uh, I went ahead of myself. We are still here. So I just did uh, the if part. Now I want to do the, oh, the, other, the other direction. This is much easier. So I want to do the other direction, which means that uh, I have um, <coughs> I have the tau the tau one. Oh, I did it this other direction. It's the same. It's a. And I want to show. <laughs> that uh, okay now what do you do here you just put alpha this is very simple you just take alpha equal c tau 2 plus d and then if you do <coughs> alpha oops alpha lambda 1 what do you get? This is uh, alpha times z plus alpha times tau 1 z. But uh, alpha, here you get that alpha, meaning c2 plus d multiplied by tau 1, by tau 1 is just a tau 2 plus b. And so here you get c tau 2 plus d times z plus a times 1 times 2 plus b times z. And this is as a lattice, is the same as a lattice z tau 2 z. Because a, b, c, d, this is uh, a, B, C, D is invertible. You are just changing this is just a different basis for this lattice because the matrix is in SL to Z. So this part was very easy. OK. Where did I put my water here? So. What does this tell us? It tells us if we want to understand L modulo C star, we only have to compute a fundamental domain for, well, only, it's, it's a big word, compute a fundamental domain for the action of gamma 1 on the upper half plane. So, <coughs> so let's see a possible candidate. A candidate is F tilde. It is this set. It's the tau in the upper half plane such that the absolute values of tau is bigger or equal than 1, and the real part of tau is in between minus 1, minus 1 half and 1 half. Why is this a good candidate? Let's see. Well, first of all, let's see how does it look like. That's the, oops, here, this, uh, this A here, it's actually rho. This is rho, it's not A. So this is the image of the set uh, described above. And um, 
Well, we have, let's see which kind of matrices we have in gamma 1. For example, we have these two matrices. What's their action on, uh, on, uh, on tau? So the first one just translates tau by 1. So you see that now this requirement here makes sense. Since you're only trans you, are trans you can translate by 1, then of course you, if you have any number in the upper half plane, you can just bring it back to something that is in this strip, meaning if you go down all the way down, they would be in this strip, but maybe we can do better. That's the, that's the idea. You just uh, reduce, uh, you just subtract once until you get uh, the real part is between minus one half and one half. S of t instead is uh, a sort of inversion in sense tau in uh, minus one over tau. And, uh, and this one is more or less the fact that uh, it reflects the part above here to the part below. So this gives the idea that we can actually restrict to this part. But then it can be, it has to be proven. So, well, we have some relation. S square is the identity, S T cube is minus one, minus the identity, T S cube is minus the identity. So in, uh, in gamma one, they are both uh, the identity because we are modeled by minus one. And this is the theorem that gives you the whole structure of the fundamental domain. So what does he say? He says, first of all, that if you take any any town in the upper half plane, then there exists a gamma that brings it back into the fundamental domain. The problem is that uh, the fundamental domain, uh, it's not, it's too big. Meaning there are situations uh, written there when something uh, can go wrong. So, and it can go wrong precisely in those situations. So, both uh, tau and gamma tau are in F tilde if either are on the vertical border, so the real part of tau is one half and gamma tau is tau minus one, and, uh, or the real part of tau is minus one half and gamma tau is tau plus one, or it's on the lower border, meaning on the circle, and gamma of t is minus one over t. So, moreover, we also need this information. Uh, if we take any tau, we define the stabilizer, just the things that fix that element, so it doesn't move. And for, as you can see from this list, for most of, most of them, except three cases, there is no stabilizer. It fixes any tau. But if tau is equal to i, then it's fixed by s. <coughs> if tau is equal to rho, it's fixed by st, and so by the group generated by S3, which is a group with three elements, as we have seen before, in gamma one bar. And if tau is minus rho bar, it's Ts. Now, oh, oh boy. We are not being fast. Um, I want to give you an idea of the proof of this one. Maybe I will not do all the details, but at least some idea because at some point, some proof has to be seen. So let's do something. For sure, I will not do all the computation uh, here, but at least I will prove the first part. I will do some, of maybe some of the computation down there. So, uh, so we take first of all we take g inside gamma one bar, and this is useful for um, a theorem later. And g is generated. by S and T. 
mm. the idea is that there should be enough to generate all of gamma one bar. We don't know it at the moment, but by proving this theorem just using G, we will be able to prove that actually that's the case after. Okay. So take any tau in, uh, in the upper half plane. Then we want to construct gamma such that gamma tau is an F tilde. I was, uh, okay, in F tilde. Okay, <clears throat> okay, write tau as S uh, plus uh, S plus I T. Then if we take any, if we take any matrix, so if we take any A, B, C, D, call it this, uh, let me call this one gamma, gamma zero. So I want to find one. So I take any gamma in a cell to Z, so in gamma one, in a cell to Z. <clears throat> if I compute, I have the dim, oops, let me, let me be, let me use my space wisely. The imaginary part of gamma tau is equal to what? It's the imaginary part of tau divided by C tau, we have seen this one already, plus D absolute value square, and so is T divided by CS plus D square plus CT square. Now, <clears throat> if tau is fixed, so there are only, f there are only <coughs> finitely many pairs CD such that, what's the thing, CS plus D plus CT square is less than M. If I fix on M and I want to see for which pairs this is less than M, since C and D are, all, are integers, it's only finitely many of them. So this means that uh, there is a minimum. So since there are only finitely many of them, I can see which one is the smallest one. So the thing is that uh, CS plus D as a minimum. But this means that, uh, what does it mean? That this guy has a maximum, because we are dividing by it. So what it means, it means that I need another blackboard. OK, let's see if I can do this. Let me try to separate the blackboard for a moment. Oh, I got scared. <laughs> it's moving by itself. OK, thank you very much. So what does it mean? This means that uh, there exists uh, gamma, gamma bar such that such that the image, the image imaginary part of gamma bar tau is maxima. OK. <clears throat> now what do we do? Now choose n such that uh, Tn of gamma bar tau the real part of this guy is less than one half. Okay? I can do, as a real part, I just pull it back by subtracting once or 
push it forward by adding ones. <coughs> and then call tau, tau prime uh, this guy. So it's uh, Tn of gamma bar two. Okay. Now you can easily prove that uh, the imaginary part of tau prime, sorry, not that one. You can prove that. Uh, oh, this one's supposed to be better. No, okay. You can prove what? You can prove that the tau prime has absolute value bigger or equal than one. Why? If tau prime <coughs> then uh, minus one over tau, tau prime, uh, how is it made? <coughs> this is just S of tau, tau prime and the imaginary part, you can check immediately the imaginary part of minus one tau prime. This peak is the, the imaginary part of tau prime, which is not, not possible because we got the maximum. Okay? Now, my time is up. So, now, well, let me just, uh, so this proves, okay, now I need, I need to be, we have to put back the, the thing, okay? They have to be. Okay. okay, that's enough, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, okay. So this means what? Uh, means that I cannot finish the proof for once, but we have proven the first part. The first part is proven. This, this, the rest of this part, it's mostly bookkeeping, and it's not very difficult. Uh, you just have to see what happens. So let's see if, if, I, if I have time, maybe we can go over some part of this. I can assign it as an exercise so you can do it. But the important thing is that, uh, okay, this is a picture, and now we'll see a few pictures, and then I will stop in two minutes. So this is the fundamental domain, so it's one means the identity. If you apply S to it, you go down here. If you apply T, you go here. T minus one goes here. S composed with T minus one, you go here. But you can do much more, meaning that's what I did with my not so much skillful but you can do this one, that it keeps going, and you can keep, 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 keep going, and that's actually what this picture is about. This picture is exact. You can see that most of the action <coughs> lives here, near the real line, because, because uh, actually, this is a, it's a, the upper half plane you, remember, you have seen Escher picture with the one with the disk and everything is happening at the border of the disk. This, those are hyperbolic disk. The upper half plane is also an hyperbolic uh, space, and there is a conformal mapping that maps the disk to the upper half plane. And this is exactly another instance of that action that everything happens at the border. The border here would go to the circumference of the disk. So this you can trace. It doesn't tell you which map, but you can see that this part here is the same part here, this part here goes here, then goes here, then goes here, with more and more maps. So, so this, ma this I didn't do. This was done by, oh. I had, I had the, let me, let me go back because I want to give to the person. So Arnaud Cheritat is a professor in France. He did this beautiful image. I asked him permission and he gave it to me to use it. It's really beautiful. Close your eyes. Okay, so we are here. And this is really a 
one of the most beautiful people. Now, as a consequence, uh, you have this is the real fundamental domain. So you have to delete this part and this part. And next time we will see how to make this one into uh, this quotient space into a Riemann surface. And then we will start to study function on this space. Modular functions and modular forms. Yeah. Fundamental domain definition is just uh, that it's, it contains one representative for each orbit, and only one. Why so, you choose uh, point A is exponential to B over in your slide? Oh, this one? This point? No, uh, in fundamental domain definition. Yeah. Which one? This one, let's see. This one. Before, what is the fundamental? This is the fun th that's when I define. No, it should all be intersect f in exactly one point. That should be a fundamental domain. So first, I introduce this one. That it's not a fundamental domain. It's just a domain. Then we have to cut out some part to get the fundamental domain. We have to cut up one of these strips, one of this line, and half the circle. And then you get a fundamental domain. We can talk about it later. Okay, I don't want to take too much time from, from your break because there is the break now.